This chapter is titled, How Do We Make Meaning? And I actually wanted to start at the end of the chapter. One of my, I have some favorite passages from this chapter that I've always liked. And one of them is on page 339 at the very end, where Lavender and Schultz, in some senses, summarized the point of the chapter. It's not necessarily how we make meaning, but that human beings are meaning making, meaning using, and meaning dependent organisms, which may seem a bit strange. Uh, how can an organism to have life be dependent on meaning? But as we've seen through their study of culture and learning and learned behavior, in many ways, we depend upon our symbols. We depend upon these meanings. We depend upon uh, others to teach us in order to, in, in order for our very survival in the world. And I guess I'm also reminded of things that I learned in, in Sunday school and growing up in, in biblical church, uh, the idea of, you know, that, uh, that I guess that I was reading an old version of the Bible, but man shall not live by bread alone, or cannot live by bread alone. And so the idea is, even in, in that biblical text, or the idea that uh, without a vision, the people perish. So that in some ways, you need something more than your physical life, or our physical life has to be meaningful. And if it's not, it doesn't, it, it may not even seem worth living. And so we are always trying to make sense of things in our lives, to make sense of events and things that happen far away. Uh, and this seems perhaps true now because we can be listening to the radio or watching something on TV or, or looking at something streaming through our phones. And, and we, we sit and we pay attention to this. This, is, this seems new, but it's been going on for many years in human life that things that happen far away in other places, in other states, in other countries can have an effect on us. It can have an effect on, on our emotions, on, our, on the way in which we view the world. And in some ways, you know, just coming up to, to school today, thinking about uh, these, these, these ideas that, you know, something happens and, and people want to make sense of it. They want to make they want to know what it means. What will it mean for now? What will it mean for the future? How will these events that we hear about influence our lives? And this is a commonality of human, of human life and human history is that we depend upon trying to make sense of the world and communicate that meaning to others. And so uh, in a now I want to go back to the beginning of the chapter to how uh, Levin and Schultz begin this chapter with something that you probably didn't think you were ever going to read about in an anthropology textbook, the notion of play, the notion of play. And so that's where they start with the idea of meaning. The, the notion of play extends from where we left off before the exam and so, or I mean, at, at, at where we left off the last chapter that we did uh, going into the exam was the chapter on language. And if you remember that chapter, it talks about language as being open, that because of our symbolic associations, that words do not have to stand concretely for things, we are able to, we, we are able to lie, we are able to talk about things in the past, in the future, things that are not here. And so language allows humans to be incredibly creative and open in their behaviors. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about language. I mentioned that when we think about language, um, it's often very difficult to think about language because you need to come up with a meta language or a language to talk about language. And in the same way here, uh, Levin and Schultz introduced this term of metacommunication, which is that play is 
in some ways a communication about communication. There's the meta, the meta part. It's stepping outside the normal boundaries of life to start uh, communicating about our practices. And uh, we often, or, or we know we are in a play moment. They talk about how play moments are framed, how you can know that you are in a situation in which you can kind of have different rules or something else is happening than normal life. So we might think about uh, the classic, uh, the blowing of a whistle to indicate the start of a game that tells you that during this time, different rules are going to apply. Uh, they mentioned having a, a dog in its play phase. So this can be, it doesn't have to be necessarily a verbal communication, but it's a communication that something different is about to happen. The normal rules of life are going to be suspended. And for those of you who, who remember or have been around uh, children when they're playing with each other, they have this wonderful way, uh, at least in English, of saying, how about, how about, let's pretend, but it's often just abbreviated to, you know, how about we're orphans? That was one of my kids' favorite how abouts. I'm not sure what that says about my parenting, but how about this? And so they start just with this how about, they begin to imagine different things and the usual, the usual rules of life get, get suspended or, or in some ways worked over. And so this also takes us back to the, uh, something we talked about in the fieldwork module, the idea of reflexivity, or that you use language and use this dialogue to uh, reflect on your own conditions of life. And so Levin and Schultz here say that we think of play as something that, you know, kids do, but play is important not only for children, but throughout our lives. That it's a way of thinking about or speculating about what should be or what could be. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a, a frame that allows us to do something different, to imagine the world in a different way. And Levin Schultz here bring up the work of Elizabeth Chin on, um, and uh, she did an, a really interesting uh, ethnography or, or did field work among uh, African-American children and how they would play with their dolls. And there's a picture of, of this um, in, uh, in Levin and Schultz where you have a, you know, a, a black girl playing with a white Barbie or, you know, and, and what, uh, Chin was saying here was that in some ways they were bringing these dolls, even though they didn't, they're, they, they weren't the same skin tone, but they were using play to bring these dolls into their lives and they were braiding their hair in certain ways that were in some ways playing with the idea about, uh, about what race could or should be. And, you know, it, it wasn't like you know, this isn't uh, this isn't a huge moment of uh, of um, it is it isn't like this was a, a huge moment of protest, but they were starting to think about the world and a, a world that could be uh, by playing with these dolls. So play here becomes a very important moment in how we how we try to make meaning of our world. I want to skip up here a little bit uh, in the second part of class. We'll talk about their next two, their, their section on art. I want to skip up here to myth. Myth is something we've seen before a long time ago, if you remember, in one of our first classes, module one, where we talked about uh, creation stories and scientific stories. And that back early on, we talked about the anthropological definition of myth and how in some ways, both creation stories and scientific stories in the anthropological sense of myth are, are both myths. Now, of course, we also then went on to talk about how, how a, a story to be scientific must be supported by material evidence. But in some sense, we can, we can zoom out here a little bit to talk about how we come up with these myths or stories that recount 
aspects of the world, how the world came to be the way it is. And so a myth in some ways is like play, but it tells you how things should be. So Levin and Schultz here first start out with talking about myth as a way of kind of constraining the free play of our imagination. So if in play, we are speculating on how the world can be, myths kind of bring us back into the way the world should be, or the way the things that we should assume to be true. And so myth in a lot of ways uh, is, a, is, is often seen as a structuring part of society that keeps people doing what they're supposed to be doing, you might say. However, interestingly, myths have this, and I, I believe that, that in some ways, all the things that Lavin and Schultz discuss in this chapter, art, religion, ritual, all have this kind of double edge that uh, on the one hand, they are the things that, uh, that, are, most, uh, th that are most part of our, our social life and we just do them without using them to think differently about the world. But at some times they can be used to challenge uh, the social order. And so myths are the same way. In some ways, a lot of times myths like you know, with the, the relationship of, of, of God and the king, for example, that the king should rule over people, uh, it seems to be a socially, you might say, a socially conservative moment. It's the, the way the world is, and everybody should do what, what the king says, because why? Because God said so. But at some point, people can use myths and use them kind of turn to turn the social order around. Or they can say, well, the, it's also true that the king should, should provide for us like, like God intended back in the day. And so you can use a myth in order to ask for a different kind of social order. And you can, in some ways, uh, people, in, especially in times of social upheaval, can use myths in, in the opposite sense to try and create new or different orders of the world based on what they think the world should be and what they feel like, well, maybe their leaders have, have deviated from and are not following the, the order as, it, as the world should be anymore. They also talk here about uh, the idea of ritual. And usually when we think of ritual, well, Dylan, what's your, your usual ritual thing you think about? Okay, yeah, we often think about ritual in this sort of uh, things are getting weird and somebody's doing a ritual sense, but in, for anthropologists, rituals can be any sort of organized part of social life, uh, which is done in, in a prescribed manner. And so it can be something as simple as a children's birthday party. And a children's birthday party is one of those rituals that uh, can be part of what anthropologists call a rite of passage. Uh, generally, I guess I would say a, a bigger birthday party, let's say uh, in some ways uh, uh, for, uh, for those who have grown up in a Spanish speaking tradition, the quinceanera, the 15th birthday for for a girl is, is seen as the, you know, or this maybe the sweet 16. It's a, it's a special birthday because you are, in some ways, the myth is that you are now transitioning from one state of society to, or one, one state of personhood to another. So rites of passage refer to those moments, weddings, funerals, graduations, uh, that transition us from one stage of life or to another. And there was an anthropologist, or he probably, he was, he did his work in, his book came out in, in 1908. So I don't even know if it was almost before anthropology. He was, uh, he was looking kind of all around the world at the ways in which different societies did their rites of passage. And basically what he analyzed is that, Almost always, 
these rites of passage follow a formula, but they have these moments in which the people or the person is separated from the group and maybe put into different clothes, maybe uh, given, maybe their heads are shaved, maybe they have their blindfolded, and then they enter this period of transition. And in this period of transition, they're kind of neither here nor there. They're in between states. There might be, and that's usually the time when the, the ritual is happening. And so, you know, there'll be a dance or there'll be a feast or something. There's this period of transition. And then at the end of it, they are reunited or they are put back into society in their new roles. So at the end of the wedding ceremony, you may kiss your partner, and then they go back and, I mean, they go out into the crowd and they have become uh, a married couple instead of two single couples. So in some ways, uh, what Van Gennep was saying is that if you looked around the world, in many different societies, these rituals follow these, the rites of passage follow these stages. A little bit later on, uh, in the 1950s, uh, the, the American anthropologist Victor Turner really developed this uh, situation with this idea even more. And what he said is that is that transition was what he called a period of liminality, a time in which, uh, you, again, you're neither here nor there, you're betwixt and between, and that in some ways it is during this transition period when the structure of life gives way to another state that he called communitas. So if you think about a wedding, for example, you can think about how, again, you're, the couple is separated, they do this transition thing, and then you have this big party, everything's going crazy, everybody's having fun, people are doing things they probably wouldn't do during a normal life, time and that's why there's all those movies about you know how the people are sleeping with each other at weddings and then they they they, uh, they come back into reality and so what Victor Turner was interested in is how during these rituals there's this period in which maybe the normal rules get suspended a little bit uh, so that people can come together and sort of let loose the idea of, of communitas spring break that's what we're missing. That's why these break days aren't working because on spring break, you're supposed to break out of the structure and have a great big community toss thing. And, you know, it's been hard to do that. Been hard to do that this year, right? So it's, it's hard to get that sense of release. And, you know, I think that uh, for me, you can think about college itself as this rite of passage. Um, and one of the things, I guess, as long as we're talking about the COVID experience of college is how much it, it has constrained those usual rites of passage that are supposed to occur during college and the whole moment of college. So, you know, I mean, I think that, as we know, if you drove by the wall recently uh, in the past few weeks or read email, um, people get very upset about not having this rite of passage at the end of college. So for me in an ideal sense, and this may sound totally insane. I almost wrote LOL on here because people are like, what class is a play? For me in an ideal sense, if we could, class is a time in which the usual rules are suspended a little bit. And we can use that time to think about the way life could be or should be in order to analyze our own lives. And so it is during class that the usual stuff doesn't apply. Now, like I said, this is probably sounding insane to you because oftentimes we experience class in a totally different way as Ah, I have to be there. I have to follow all these rules. Somebody's talking to me. I have to write things down. I have to do these things. I have to get a grade. And, you know, yeah, we've done that to you. And, you know, I'm guilty as charged here. But I guess I would say in an ideal world, 
or an ideal class situation, we use this time in order to think, to think about what life should be like because we have this wonderful opportunity to be a little bit outside of the cares of trying to get things, you know, get, get life together, as it were. So each class would be, you know, kind of like playing a ball game. And then college itself, the whole experience, three, four, five years of it, you could think of that as itself a big rite of passage, a time in which you come into a place where, yeah, there's rules, but in some ways in an ideal college experience, some of the rules can be bent a little bit, right? You don't have to deal as much with the, you know, the social rules. And so, again, in an ideal sense, this should be a time of communitas when you're, you're sort of between, between the, uh, the, the, I don't know if I want to call high schoolers childhood, but, you know, between that stage and that time when you have to have a job and, you know, support yourself. And I realize, again, that's a little bit of a speaking from, from privilege here. If you have the privilege to just attend college without, without having to worry about that stuff, it's great. And so, you know, I mean, I think that you can use some of these things of the rite of passage to look at your own life or to look at things that we are ideally supposed to do. Of course, as Victor Turner said, or Levin and Schultz say, an interpretation of Victor Turner, you're always going to have to have the end of the party. The wedding's going to be over. The college is going to be done. The party's going to be done. That liminality, that betwixt and between state goes back into structure. Somebody's got to clean up. And so somebody has to, again, I said that there was a privilege there to be able to come in and not worry about who's making dinner or who's paying for this for a short period of time. But the problem is that our lives are always shot through with these relationships of power and inequality. Somebody's got to make dinner. Somebody's got to be cleaning this up. And so what... Uh, what they're saying here is that our ideas about, you know, being able to, to have this moment of freedom go back again into these rules and structuring of our lives. And then they say that, you know, the more you sort of do the, the drudgery of the structure, again, then you're going to need that, that release or that communitas. And that's why for many people, there's kind of an, an annual cycle of these things that are built into society. So you have, you know, the Thanksgiving, and then you have uh, the December holidays, which are crazy communitas time. And then you, you know, you go back in and have that tough time of January, February. Hopefully then you get your spring break. In school, you get that big summer break sometimes. Now, again, this is not to say that everyone, we always have to pay attention to, to the power and inequality that not everyone has to is able to have this. A lot of people have to have to work during and all this time, but it's a way of you know hopefully thinking about what could or should or might be uh, in society. 